television networks, C-SPAN Radio, and C-SPAN.org. This is C-SPAN's America and the Courts. Next, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals oral argument in United States versus Massawi. The court will decide if convicted 9-11 conspirator Zacharias Massawi should have his conviction overturned and receive a new trial. The court heard this case on January 26th in Richmond, Virginia. Circuit. We're ready in a case in the United States against Massawi. Mr. Annapolini. Good morning and may it please the court. Justin Antoni Pillay of Arnold and Porter on behalf of Zacharias Massawi. Massawi's plea was uncounseled, unknowing, unintelligent, and it violated Rule 11. Under controlling authority, this court should vacate the plea and remand for a process that comports with the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. <coughs> Massawi's you sentence... You filed a mountain of paper in this case, and yet I don't believe received a 28J letter from you regarding the Second Circuit's recent case in in terrorist bombings. I found that omission kind of interesting, particularly since you claimed in your reply brief that the lower court in that case, quote, misapplied SEPA and did not the court below and took the very limited scope of acceptable prohib prohibitions on attorney client commun communications and expanded them beyond recognition under existing law. If we agree with the Second Circuit, does that dismiss virtually all of your constitutional claims regarding the voluntariness of Massawi's plea? No, Judge uh, Williams, and uh, we didn't file a 28-J only because the government had filed the 28-J to alert the court to it, to this particular case. I apologize if we should have done it as well. Um, <clears throat> in rate terrorist bombings is consistent with our argument. Our argument is that under SIFA, once the court determines that material is in fact discoverable, uh, consistent with the United States versus Smith, in other words, that the, that the uh, discovery is in fact material to the case or important to an issue in the case, that information under SIFA Section 4 must either be produced to the defendant or if the government chooses not to produce the classified material, must put the defendant in the place he or she would have been had the classified material, uh, excuse me, been produced. In raid terrorist bombings is consistent with that position in the sense that it, it basically endorsed the notion that once the information is in fact deemed to be discoverable, it has to be produced in a fashion that can be dis discussed among um, uh, counsel and the client. Didn't counsel get it, but the defendant didn't get it. There's nothing wrong, Judge Williams, in the abstract about having some information go to counsel that doesn't go to the client. The problem is where the information is, in fact, deemed to be discoverable under, in the Fourth Circuit, United States versus Smith. At that point, the, the district court cannot restrict the lawyer and the client to talk about that information because it impairs the attorney-client relationship. It puts the attorney in the position of having to tell the client, make recommendations about what to do in the case, but having one hand tied behind their back. In this case, for example, you would have lawyers who, on the record, made very clear that they were counseling their client not to plead guilty. At the time they made their recommendation to the client not to plead guilty, they possessed information that the district court and this court had found to be material to the case and indeed exculpatory, which was in fact more that's re than required under United States versus Smith because it's exculpatory. That cannot be, that cannot equal receiving the advice of counsel. 
because the counsel is impaired. I'm sorry. Didn't we condone that basically, though, in Abu Ali? Judge Traxler, Abu Ali is entirely consistent with our case. Abu Ali, again, once the information was deemed to be discoverable under United States v. Smith, the information went to the defendant. So what happened in Abu Ali? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by discoverable. You mean exculpatory? No. Under United States v. Smith, the test is basically material to the case or important to an issue in the case. I believe I'm paraphrasing. But the district court in Abu Ali determined that some information was, in fact, some classified information was, in fact, material to the case or important to an issue in the case. And it required that the government produce that information in a fashion that could be shared with the defendant himself. That's entirely consistent with what we're saying. The problem is if you don't do what I just said. I had gathered from your argument that you were saying that anything the lawyer saw, the client was entitled to see. No, that's not what we're saying, Judge Traxler. The other case, I'm sorry. Let me just ask you another question. It's my understanding, and I'm coming into this late. Understood. To put it mildly. I apologize for the paper. I appreciate your sympathy. My understanding is that this was an ongoing process. That is the determination as to what the defendant himself was going to be allowed to see, that the process was not complete, the judge had not ruled exactly what he was going to be able to see, and that he, in effect, short-circuited that process by entering his guilty plea. That's correct in part. Some of the evidence in the case and some of the evidence that we are focused on, the district court had found to not only be material, because that's the standard under Smith, but to be material and exculpatory. In other words, it tended to prove that Massawi was innocent of the charges he was facing. That's more than is required under Smith. And we cited the court orders in which the court specifically held that. And this court, obviously, in the Massawi 2 opinion, validated that. It, too, found the information to be material and exculpatory. And yet at the time of the plea, so that for certain parts of the information, that was complete. The court had found it to be material and exculpatory. And yet at the time of the plea, counsel could not discuss that very information with their own client. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but my understanding is that that is because the process was still ongoing, that the judge had not made the final decision as to exactly what it was he was going to get to see, that there were further steps to be taken before a final determination was going to be made that he could or could not see particular information. That's correct in part, Judge Traxler, but it was because the district court took the position, which was our third argument, but took the position that discovery productions were complete among productions to the lawyer. So there are literally dozens of orders, and we can cite them, where counsel and Massawi, who was representing himself pro se, said, I need access to that information or something similar to it, the stuff that you have already held to be material and exculpatory. And the court said, no, you don't get access to that. We're going to go through a process, and at some point at trial you may get it. But that's not sufficient to say that the plea is counseled. Our point is, before you can say a plea is counseled, you cannot have a lawyer restricted from discussing material exculpatory information with the client, just as we wouldn't say that somebody has had the advice of their doctor if the doctor was barred from discussing a test result, and we wouldn't say that somebody had the advice of a counselor if the counselor couldn't talk about treatment options. You can't say that somebody has had the advice of counsel if the evidence has been deemed to be material and exculpatory and they're barred from discussing it. And just to give the court an idea of what we're talking about, some of the evidence actually was admitted at trial, and it's public now. So let me just talk about it. How do we know that Massawi would not have been given unclassified substitutes had the case proceeded to trial? Your Honor, we don't know one way or another. It's possible he would have received them. It's possible he wouldn't. But that presumes that Brady is solely a trial right. In other words, at least six circuits have examined the question about if you have a Brady violation in connection with a plea, is that a basis for declaring the plea? This is separate from the advice of counsel. If you have a Brady violation in connection with a plea. But wasn't the discovery phase still going on when Massawi chose to plead guilty? It was, but as to certain documents, Judge Williams, and I understand the hesitancy because the defendant took a plea and there was some process going on. But for some of it. Why can't we really say that any of these alleged errors rendered his plea involuntary? 
Judge Williams, we're saying it's involuntary. That's one of them. If it weren't yet even finalized. Our point is that it was uncounseled. And the point we're trying to make is when a district court enters an order that restricts a lawyer and a client from talking, the court has to be sure before a plea is taken that that order has not impeded the counseling of a plea. And that's what we're saying took place here. I understand, obviously, the district judge, and I want to note this, this was an extraordinarily difficult case. Among other things, you have a defendant that was charged in one of the most heinous criminal acts in our country's history, and the district judge did the best that she could under the circumstances. But this was a circumstance in which the order that was entered, and there were objections to this particular evidence, including 15 days prior to the plea, the defense counsel filed a motion in which defense counsel said, Ms. Sowey needs to see this very evidence, and said even more specifically, it's impeding our ability to communicate with our counsel because he doesn't understand and doesn't believe what we're saying. And yet that issue was not resolved at the time of the plea. So you have counsel. Our basic point is this is not a counseled plea. This is no different than saying. Are you talking about Mr. Yamamoto? All of the counsel were under the same restriction. They were all under. Mr. Yamamoto said that Mr. Sowey knew everything. He did not know this information, Your Honor. He did not. In fact, four days. I apologize if I'm interrupting. I'll wait for the question. I apologize. Did you? I don't know what it is that you think that he didn't get. Four days after the plea, the district court specifically noted on the record that the information we are citing, which is, and if the court would permit me, I'll talk about it more specifically, but Ms. Sowey at the time was charged with participating in a conspiracy that included the 9-11 attacks. At the time of this, at trial, among the evidence that was admitted was testimony from the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who's testified repeatedly that Ms. Sowey had nothing to do with these attacks. He was completely for a separate attack. He listed all of the people that were supposed to be participating in the attacks, including people who ultimately didn't participate but were intended. He said repeatedly, notwithstanding that all of those people were supposed to be part of 9-11, Ms. Sowey was not supposed to be part of 9-11. He went on to describe that the idea for 9-11 was his, which obviously contradicted some of the things in the record at that time. Yeah. Let's talk about that record. I mean, didn't Mr. Ms. Sowey state in open court that all four planes identified above were flying in the special aircraft and hijacked and all were completely destroyed and that before your arrest, the question was before your arrest, were you scheduled to be a pilot in the operation that was ultimately run on September 11th? And Mr. Ms. Sowey said yes. Your Honor, is that the testimony from Phase 1? I believe he testified about that. The point, if the court's question is did his testimony render harmless the error at the plea, and the answer is no, because a deprivation of the right to counsel, an uncounseled plea, is one for which you do not have to demonstrate any prejudice. And let me be clear about what we're saying. The problem as a practical matter was twofold. One, Ms. Sowey couldn't know whether his counsel's advice was in fact legitimate. In other words, you go to your client and you say, I'm recommending you don't plead guilty, but I can't tell you why. The client doesn't know whether or not to believe what you're saying or whether or not that's advice that he or she should take. And on the flip side. Mr. Ms. Sowey was saying I was supposed to pilot the plane to hit the White House. Your Honor, I agree with you, and that would be relevant if there were a prejudice analysis, but I'm saying that the plea is uncounseled. An uncounseled plea, you don't do a prejudice analysis, because under Getters and Perry, when you have a substantive restriction on the plea, I see you may have a question. But this is not an uncounseled plea. Your argument is that it's an impaired counseling. It's a constructive deprivation of counsel under Cronic. Cronic says if you have an official interference with the defense, that is a constructive deprivation of counsel. And Getters and Perry, Perry, for example, looks at the fifth, was the case that approved basically a 15-minute restriction on counsel talking to the client during a 15-minute break. But critical to the Supreme Court in validating that, Judge Gregory, was that there could be nothing discussed during that 15 minutes that they were permitted to discuss. That's the reason. So 
There is no case, even the cases cited by the government, don't restrict attorneys and clients about talking about material exculpatory evidence. That's just not a counsel plea. And it would be devastating to the Sixth Amendment to say that the court could restrict attorneys and clients from talking about evidence that has been deemed material and exculpatory as to the defendant. It would give the government an incredible advantage when you're getting into situations like this. Well, you said we don't balance prejudice, but don't you have to show that the impairment was to the point that it was effectively it was uncounseled? Yes, Judge Gregory, but I think a restriction that prevents a lawyer and a client from discussing evidence that's been deemed to be material and exculpatory is that impairment. That is exactly what Getters and Perry say, and it's consistent with this court's holding in common. Your point is the court has already determined how important it is by making that finding. That's right. And, in fact, the Fourth Circuit approved those findings under either an abuse of discretion or a de novo finding. And it's because it's right. This evidence was absolutely critical to the defense. The man was facing charges that he was involved in 9-11, and you have the mastermind of 9-11 saying that he was absolutely not involved and explained in detail that he was not involved. Of course somebody who's going to take a plea will want to know that information. And McMahon, you know, one of the critical Supreme Court cases that the government cites for the right, the notion that there's a guilty plea bar is the McMahon case. And there's a great discussion in McMahon about why it is that a guilty plea that's counseled weighs antecedent constitutional violations. And there's an explanation. The court says, look, at the end of the day, counsel can assess the evidence that they've been given. They can talk to the client, and the two of them together can make a judgment about whether it's better to go to trial or better to take the guilty plea. That's the reason that a counseled guilty plea weighs antecedent constitutional violations. Didn't the Second Circuit uphold a counseled client restriction on communication? That was in a case, Judge Williams. Didn't that circuit do it under the Perry and Getters? We are not saying yes. And the answer is yes. We are not saying that there is no circumstance under which you can restrict attorney-client communications. The courts of appeals have approved many restrictions. The point is, in none of those cases did the court approve a restriction that prevented the attorney and client from talking about information to which the defendant was entitled. That Second Circuit case was a case in which the district court restricted the defendant from having access to information to which he wasn't entitled. It's the same in the Fourth Circuit case in which there was a Jenks inquiry, and the court ultimately determined that the information was not, in fact, Jenks. And so the court said, well, you can't discuss that Jenks information with your client. That is a wholly different situation from saying that a court can restrict an attorney from discussing with his client material and exculpatory information. And, indeed, even the fact that we are looking at those cases, each of the cases that's cited by the government, whether it's Perry, Getters, the Second Circuit case, the case involving Jenks, all of those were narrowly tailored restrictions. Even Roviaro, you're talking about narrowly tailored restrictions on information to which the defendant is not entitled. The notion that we could use those cases as a basis to say that somehow a court could restrict an attorney and client from talking about material exculpatory information is a very sad statement about how far those cases have gone. Counsel, I'd like to ask you a practical question. And if it compromises your position and strategy as counsel, please don't answer it. It won't be held against you. But if you only, and I know you have other issues, but if you only prevail on this issue as presented, where does that put your client? Don't you then go back to full circle, the jeopardy of capital punishment? I don't know, Judge Gregory. I think there might be some arguments on that issue under Satizan, for example. But the point is, a guilty plea that's invalid, and I know this isn't answering your question. I don't mean to speechify. But a guilty plea that's invalid is invalid. No, I understand that. I just wonder, is that a sword of Damocles over your head? I understand. All right. Should the trial judge have refused to take the plea? Is that your position? The trial judge should have taken the step to ensure, just to ensure that the order entered that prevented the attorney client from talking didn't prevent a counsel plea. I know, but, I mean, your argument is that he could not voluntarily plead guilty at that stage, where he had not been provided exculpatory evidence, and that if that's so, then she should not have taken his plea. I would say slightly differently, Judge Traxler, because I'm sensitive. You know, the judge, as I said, was doing the best she could under the circumstances. But he was represented by counsel, and I think 
you can waive the right to counsel in connection with anything. So if you had a knowing and intelligent waiver of the right to counsel or knowing and intelligent waiver of the right to counsel at that plea, then it's possible you could have taken the plea under those circumstances. The problem is this particular... Well, she should have asked him, are you aware that by pleading guilty you're forfeiting any further claim to exculpatory evidence? Well, I don't think that would be the question. I think the question would be you understand your client is barred from discussing with you evidence that's been deemed to exculpate you. I don't mean to dictate, but this is... Fundamentally, you want a waiver that is knowing and intelligent of the right the defendant is waiving. And here, the right that the defendant is waiving is the right to free and open communication about material and exculpatory evidence. So that's the right that would need to be waived in order for the plea to be taken. She should have explicitly asked him that. Yeah, and indeed, you know, the government, the defense counsel flagged this issue, that particular issue for the district court in a filing at the time of the first plea. The defense counsel said, we have material exculpatory information that the defendant doesn't have. At the very least, you should include that in your Rule 11 colloquy if you're going to have a Rule 11. Well, Rule 11... I know it's not... ...doesn't have that, obviously. So you would have us impose in this type of situation a new requirement on trial district judges who are taking pleas at this stage in the proceedings. Judge Traxler, again, I'm sensitive to not imposing a broad set of absolute requirements on district courts who are obviously taxed and do a lot of Rule 11 colloquies. My point is that it is rare and should be very rare that a district court ever enters an order that says the attorney and the client can't talk about something. And if that has happened, there has to be some sensitivity that that might affect the ability for there to be a counsel plea. And that's the reason we're saying at the time of the plea that had not been cured. By the way, one point that's important about this right to counsel, we are not saying and have never said that Massawi was entitled to classified information. And if SEPA had just been followed, then the information is supposed to go to the defendant in a form that is declassified. Or it doesn't even have to be classified. The defendant is supposed to be given information that puts him or her in the position that they would have been had they gotten the classified information. That's what United States v. Smith says. So it doesn't need to be necessarily the classified information. They didn't follow SEPA, and it created a Sixth Amendment violation at the time of the plea. Well, now, at sentencing, for instance, didn't the government end up either declassifying all of the Section 5 designated material or giving Massawi unclassified substitutes? Why wouldn't the government have followed that same procedure during the trial? That's possible, Judge Williams, but it doesn't cure the Sixth Amendment violation. You can't call – our basic point is you cannot call a plea counsel if at the time of the plea a defense lawyer has material exculpatory information and has been barred from discussing it with their own client. That is a constructive deprivation of counsel, and it's contrary to everything the Supreme Court said in Robert M. Brady, in McMahon. It just is not a counsel plea, and an uncounseled plea is invalid as a matter of law. So I understand – Did you say Massawi did not know that there was any material exculpatory evidence before he pled? He may have known that there was information out there, but his counsel were prohibited from discussing it with him at the time of the plea, and that's just not a counsel plea. It's the same – the bottom line is in order – the right to counsel means more than just getting the recommendation. It means being able to explain to your client why it is that you're recommending that they not plead guilty. This district court on the record must have noted four times that counsel very strongly believed that Massawi should not plead guilty at that point, and they had this – some of the information that ultimately came in that trial through KSM, and they also had information from Hassawi – Hassawi and Al-Qahtani both testified at trial, and they both testified that Al-Qahtani was the intended 20th hijacker. So you have Massawi signing his statement of facts with the words 20th hijacker, perhaps in jest, and at the time his lawyers had information that had been deemed material and exculpatory that demonstrated that somebody else was the 20th hijacker, and they could not discuss that with him. And again, this is important not only for Massawi. Yeah, but he made his own statements about what all he had done and what he knew was going on. Your Honor, Judge Williams, I understand he made statements, and I understand his testimony at trial, and I'm happy to address his testimony at trial as well, but it doesn't make the plea counsel. His lawyers, who were court-appointed at that moment, could not talk about material exculpatory information at the time of the plea. I don't mean to be repeating myself, but 
But we did, I, I see my time is already up. I had other points. I'm happy to uh, go through them. I was going to address Brady, uh, the Brady argument, and then the sentencing argument, if the court permits. But otherwise, I'm, I'm happy to sit. I have a number of questions. Go ahead. Could I, could I proceed or did the court? Judge Trax, was that a trick? Sure. We were talking a little bit a while back about um, what the def judge should have told him when he was pleading guilty. And one of the things she did tell him, if you went to trial, there would also be various rights and protections that you would have at trial that you're giving up with a guilty plea. First, you would be able to see and hear the government's evidence, and you could test it through cross-examination of your attorneys. And he indicated he understood that. So my question is, why doesn't that reflect a warning from her that if you plead guilty, you're going to give up the right to see the evidence it, it does, that the it does, government has. It does reflect that warning, that there's some evidence that might be coming later. It doesn't mean that the plea was counseled. And in, in six circuits, in six circuits, the courts have, been, have looked at exactly that same, obviously ju most district judges follow the same Rule 11 uh, colloquy. And that language is usually part of the Rule 11 colloquy. And six circuits have said, notwithstanding, not, I shouldn't say said, but there's three circuits have, have held this, two circuits have suggested it as part of a totality of the circumstances analysis, and one circuit has, uh, has suggested this as well. That notwithstanding that warning in a Rule 11 colloquy, if there is a Brady violation, that is nonetheless a basis to say that the plea was unknowing or, un, or involuntary, notwithstanding that. The point is that you can waive waive the notion of getting certain evidence in the future. But if at the time of the plea, the government has Brady evidence, no, and it knows that it has it, and it hasn't turned it over, that is and still it's not... And without just cause. And it's without with just it. cause, and it's not cumulative, and so right. forth. I, all of the Brady thing. Right. And then they go through this analysis, and it's material. But that's still a basis. So the Rule 11 colloquy does say that you're waiving the right to get certain evidence in trial, but Court after court has said that if there is a Brady violation in, in connection with the plea, that that's still a, a basis for a plea. And our, our point is, is twofold. One, every court of appeals that has actually analyzed, analyzed this issue has said that a Brady violation in connection with a plea is, in fact, a basis to say that the plea was unknowing or involuntary, point one. Point two is that Brady is a personal right. It has to be a personal right. Every case that talks about Brady talks about the information going to the defendant. So the notion that the district court could enter an order that says the Brady right is cured, is, is done, when the information goes to the lawyers under circumstances that it can't be shared with the defendant, that's contrary to Brady. And the reason for that is the defendant has certain fundamental decisions that is only in the, in the, in the um, it's, it's something that the defendant alone has to make. The way, right, waiver of the right to jury trial, the right to plead guilty. A waiver of the right to counsel, right to take an appeal. These are defendant-only rights. And the notion that the defendant could make those decisions without Brady is, is, uh, is, is not proper. That's just not what was intended. So the, def the Brady right has to go to the defendant. That's the whole point of these cases that talk about the guilty plea. All right, let, let me, there are a couple other sure, questions I, I need to ask, mostly um, as a factual matter to help me get up to speed as to what the situation was. What requirements were placed on would-be counsel if they'd been selected by the defendant to be his attorney with regard to clearances? In other words, what requirements, what clearance requirements would any attorney have had to have met? They had to be nationally <coughs> security cleared. That was what the judge held at the April 2002 hearing. Did that they mean would, they had to be SEPA cleared? That's my understanding of that, yes. Okay. What ability did the defendant have to contact counsel on his own? None, as far as I know. He was subject to a SAMS, a special administrative measures that prevented him from contacting anybody other than the counsel that had been appointed. All right. Weren't there some efforts made by his appointed counsel to secure the counsel with the requirements that he was wanting to impose? There were some lawyers that entered. I don't know. The, I don't know in the record whether that, that, that occurred. There are some lawyers that did, in fact, come in and offer to enter an appearance for Massawi at various points. He rejected one, and then another one, Brother Freeman, did in fact come in and then was um, ultimately, um, he didn't enter a pro hoc appearance. The district court said if you don't enter a pro hoc appearance, then you can't be counsel of record, and then barred that, that, that lawyer, Brother Freeman, 
from even serving as advisory counsel to Ms. Howie. All right. Under the circumstances of this case, what do you contend should have been done in order to accommodate his right to retain counsel of his choosing? One, there should be no restriction. There should be no requirement in any case that all lawyers have to be cleared. In fact, even in Abu Ali, that's not what the restriction said. The restriction said if you want access to classified information, you have to get a clearance, which is almost self-explanatory. But the court, even in Abu Ali, didn't say that every lawyer had to be cleared. And the reason this is so important is by imposing that requirement, you basically give the government at least an implied veto over anybody that comes in as your client in the case. And there are some lawyers that just do not want to go through a national security background check. It's just an incredibly invasive procedure. And more importantly, under SEPA, it's unnecessary. The whole point of SEPA is that information should not be going to the defense that's classified. It's supposed to be going to the defense in a manner that can be used by the defendant. That's the whole point of the SEPA court process. And that can, in fact, go on ex parte. In other words, if the government has information that's classified that it's not sure whether it needs to be turned over to the defense, the government can go into the court ex parte and get a ruling on is this, in fact, something that needs to be produced. And then if the court determines that it does need to be produced, the government has a number of options to try and put the defendant in the place he or she would have been had that information been produced. All right. Is there any evidence that this alternative procedure was recommended or suggested to the court? Well, there was the notion. I mean, there must be 15 filings, which I'm happy to identify if the court gives me a moment, in which the defendant objected to the notion of having to get any counsel cleared. He said it over and over and over again. In fact, even at his plea hearing, every single one of his plea hearings, he said, I was never given the opportunity to choose the lawyer who I wanted to represent me. Okay. I'm familiar with those. I hate to cut you off. No, no, no. I apologize. You have answered my question. Okay. I have some others, though. Okay. Is there anything that would have kept him from entering a conditional plea pursuant to Rule 11A2 to explicitly preserve a number of the issues that you raised here today? I believe a conditional plea has to be entered by consent of both parties. There are a number. A conditional plea is not easy to enter, I guess is the simplest way to put it. There are a number of cases, even from this court, in which this court has said that's not really a conditional plea. The clearest one to me is the notion of having the government agree. I believe that this could be. Do you know if any effort was made to accomplish a conditional plea? No, I'm not aware of any effort on that. He did try at the time. Now, again, he was pro se sometimes and sometimes not pro se. He did really want to try and raise the issue of the substitution question further up, but he did not. There was no specific effort at the time of the actual guilty plea to try a conditional plea. Okay. Let me get you to switch over now to the death eligibility rules. Yes, Judge Trenton. Could you explain to me how, as a practical matter, given the sentences that were ultimately imposed, how that prejudiced the defendant? Yes, Judge Trenton. Massawi was treated as though he pled guilty to involvement in the 9-11 attacks. The statement of facts didn't actually admit that fact, i.e., didn't admit that the conspiracy to which he was pleading guilty was the same as the 9-11 conspiracy. I misled you. Okay, I apologize. Let me try to refine my question. Okay, sure. The jury ultimately first made, in the penalty phase, made a death eligibility decision. Yes. And then that ultimately, as I believe you contend, impacted the sentence that he received on the death eligible counts. Yes. And he ultimately received a life sentence for those. He got life sentences also on non-death eligible counts. Now, my question is, your argument is that he should never have been, the jury was never should have been allowed to make a decision as to whether or not he was death eligible, and that that ultimately impacted his sentence, that error that you allege occurred. And I'm asking you as a practical matter, what prejudice that mistake, if it was a mistake, had on this case? Thank you, Judge Trenton. I apologize for getting it wrong. No, it wasn't a good question. The death, as a result of the finding of death eligibility, the district court and the finding of one aggravating factor, under the Federal Death Penalty Act, the court was bound, had no discretion other than to enter whatever sentence the jury prescribed. And the jury's, jury in the state in phase two basically said, we don't decide to enter death, and so we decide to enter a life imprisonment without parole. Because of the finding of death eligibility, the district court was bound by that judgment. It had no discretion. Without the finding of death eligibility, what would have happened 
is that the sentencing phase, sentence would have gone to the discretion of the district court on each count. The district court would have had an option of imposing a term of life, I'm sorry, a term of years up to life. What we are saying is the district court did not have that discretion. And because the court ultimately entered a sentence of life in prison without parole, that was incorrect because of the finding of death eligibility. And so the sentence should be vacated, and the district court should merely have the opportunity to exercise its discretion on each of the counts to enter a sentence of either a term of years or life, but not death. And weren't there some counts where life was not mandated by the decision of the jury? That's right. And there she gave life. That's right. But, Your Honor, at the time, first of all, the judge, you know, when the judge is doing a sentencing analysis, obviously it looks at all the conduct together, and one count can influence whether another count goes up to life. So it's very difficult to say what the court would have done had it actually been presented with the decision to sentence Ms. Sowery to any term of years or life when the decision was within its own discretion. All we are asking for on the sentence, and it's limited, and it may be very limited depending on what the district court decides to do, but the district court ought to have the opportunity to exercise the discretion it should have had had there not been an incorrect finding of death eligibility, and there should not have been a death penalty on the table. Well, on your sentencing claims, according to the PSR that was prepared for some of the counts, Ms. Sowery's offense level is a 58, and his criminal history category is a 6. He doesn't even appear on the chart on the back of the guidelines manual. His offense is so high. Is there actually a sentence other than life that he could get? Judge Williams, the pre-sentence report should never have been prepared. Under the Federal Death Penalty Act, the court is not supposed to prepare a pre-sentence report. As I understand it from the record, it was prepared primarily for the Department of Prisons, and there's a Second Circuit case in which the Second Circuit specifically held that in a federal death penalty case, there's to be no pre-sentence report. But second, just to address the pre-sentence report, if Ms. Sowery had not been found to be death eligible and therefore not responsible for all of the deaths on 9-11, the pre-sentence report would have come out differently. The pre-sentence report presupposed that he was responsible for all of the deaths on 9-11, and of course that's going to result in an extraordinarily long recommended sentence. But even if there were a pre-sentence report... Well, the statement of fact clearly said that Ms. Sowery's lies permitted his associates to go forward with their plans. It then includes several paragraphs discussing the September 11 attacks, and Ms. Sowery signed off the statement of fact as the 20th hijacker. Judge Williams, that's... Is that a little disingenuous for you to complain that there's no adequate factual basis? I certainly don't mean to be disingenuous. The statement of facts as it's drafted, Judge Williams, basically says, although the court has it, it's drafted so that it says Ms. Sowery was involved in a plot to hijack airplanes, and then it describes that the September 11 attack took place, and it uses the word the plan or the operation to make the connection between the two, but nowhere in there does it admit that the two conspiracies are the same, specifically. And the reason this is important is, of course, what is included within the scope of the conspiracy is a jury question. So there has to be a specific admission of fact that the two conspiracies are the same. Otherwise, it's not admitted. So it does have those sentences, but I don't think using the same pronoun or the same the operation to make the connection between the two conspiracies is sufficient to satisfy the notion that he's responsible for all of 9-11. And indeed, that's part of the reason you have the Federal Death Penalty Act to look at what the personal responsibility is. The bottom line is just the following on the sentencing point. The judge never got to exercise her discretion. The government does not seriously, I mean, they include footnote. I think it's fair to say they are challenging and strongly challenging any notion that they didn't prove by sufficient evidence that Ms. Sowery's act directly resulted in a death. Our point is that is just not a valid theory on the way this was proven. If he had not been demonstrated to have... He was asked in paragraph 16 of your statement of facts, you indicated that you lied to allow your al-Qaeda brothers to go forward. Do you recall that? And he said, I believe that's correct. Judge Williams, an example, I'm way over my time. I would answer this question this way. If you were part of the mob and 
Um, so you might know about your particular conspiracy. I might be in the mob and I steal cars. And there's another operation going on where they're killing people. Um, the theory of the government is that when they came to arrest, they come to arrest me and I deny that I'm a member of the mob. And I lie because I want this other operation to go forward, the, the one in which somebody's going to get killed. That's what that admits yeah, to. That you, they agreed to have that <laughs> for these people, and it was different ways that they were going to do it. Yeah, but my point, Judge Williams, is just that by, by, by denying that I am a member of the mob and therefore lying so that my, the other mob operation go, can go on, that does not admit that the two conspiracies are the same. So he did not, in the statement of facts, admit that his conspiracy was the same as the 9-11. I'm statement of facts. I'm saying what his testimony under oath what said. Yes. I, I agree. In, in his testimony in phase one and phase two, he clearly admits uh, to participation in the 9-11 the conspiracy. Uh, for the sentencing point, my, my only point on the sentencing is he should not have been found to be death. I, I'm repeating myself. I, I, uh, I'll stop unless the court has a question. Yeah, I'd like just to briefly go back to Judge Traxler's question, <clears throat> the prejudice. Uh, since obviously the record is clear that Mr. Massawi was sentenced on the non-capital matters uh, <coughs> count to life, and your argument is that it show prejudice. But how do, how do we find that on the record that uh, the district court was not aware that she could have given less than life on those counts, when she in fact did sentence to life? Or where is it in a gall analysis that that's unreasonable or it's plainly on the record that we can see that? Uh, the only thing I can say about that, Judge Gregory, is that she had a pre-sentence report in front of her that should never have been ordered. And when you do a pre-sentence report, as the court is aware, every count is influenced by the most severe count for which you're sentenced. So if you're sentenced, if you're being sentenced for, for conspiracy to participate in a weapon, to use a weapon of mass destruction that resulted in the deaths of 3,000 people, I think the lowest you're ever going to get is, is uh, you know, life in prison without parole. And that's going to influence in the pre-sentence report the other counts. So she, was, she had in front of her a pre-sentence report on those counts. She thought she was sentencing him based on his act directly resulted in the deaths. And she, under her own statements at the time, and she said this repeatedly, including at the sentencing hearing, said she did not have the discretion to do anything other than impose what the jury had said. So that's why there's prejudice. If there had been no finding of death eligibility, and Massawi was not therefore responsible for all of the deaths on 9-11, the pre-sentence report would have been written differently, and that would have influenced the sentence on the other two counts. Either way, all we're saying is that the judge should have the, have the opportunity, especially when the sentence is life in prison without parole. If the judge incorrectly did not, never had the opportunity to exercise her discretion under Booker, she should have the opportunity to exercise her discretion with the proper pre-sentence report in front of her. Well, I'll, can I, can I yes, sure. to follow up on that question, when she was trying to determine the sentence, um, she took a great deal of testimony. Now. Why, if, if she felt bound to give this person an automatic life sentence on every count, why would she take all that testimony and listen to that? I, I imagine there were other, this was, this was a heinous, the 9-11 attacks were a heinous criminal act. This was one of the first cases in which anybody had been charged with participating in that conspiracy. There, there were many other reasons why I think the judge could have reasonably concluded that somebody wanted to voice reasonably the victims who had been, there were terrible things said about the victims and their families, and they're indefensible. And I can imagine many reasons why the judge might have let people come in and talk at that hearing, even if she felt bound to impose a, a life sentence without parole. And, and more importantly, Judge Traxler, she said explicitly on the record several times that she believed she had no discretion. So, I mean, as far as the record evidence is concerned, she did not believe she had the discretion to do anything other than that. And the Federal Death Penalty Act says the same thing. Uh, there's a point in the brief that this was somehow invited error, which I'd like to address unless the court is comfortable on this point. Our point on the invited error is <clears throat> that the mistake about the available sentences occurred in 2002 for the first time, well before he pled. The district judge said on the record there are only two sentences available for the first four counts, life or death. At that point, there's no strategic choice to give up a term of years. You don't give up the term of years as a strategic matter when you're doing a, a, a Rule 11 colloquy. If you make that decision to give up the term of years, you do it at the sentencing phase. 
And even when you got to the sentencing phase, the district court asked both parties, the government and the defense, what's the law under the statute? She didn't ask, is this a strategic choice or what's the negotiation? She said, what is the law under the statutes? Do they all provide for either life or term of years? And both parties said at least one of the counts, they just made a mistake about the counts, but at least one of the counts provides at least the lowest sentence, life or a term of years. So it's a mutual mistake. And the invited error doctrine does not apply to a mutual mistake because there's no strategic choice. Defense counsel at the time, they said it's either life or death. They didn't think they were giving anything up because the court had already said in 2002 and in 2005 during the plea hearing that it's only life or death. I've gone way over my time. I'll take any other questions. I've saved a few moments. Thank you. Mr. Gingras. Good morning, Chief Judge Williams. May it please the court. Kevin Gingras here on behalf of the United States. This is a case about a defendant, Zacharias Massaoui, who pleaded guilty unconditionally and against the vigorous advice of his counsel and who, when he pleaded guilty, was clear that he was forever waiving his right to challenge his factual guilt or to complain about district court rulings before the plea. And then a year later, at his capital sentencing hearing, he gets up on the stand and he testifies twice about how he was in fact guilty. And he testified that he rejoiced in the nearly 3,000 deaths that resulted from his conspiracies. So the only real question before this court should be whether Massaoui knew and understood the nature of the charges against him and the consequences of pleading guilty, and if he did, if he chose to plead guilty voluntarily. The circumstances surrounding the plea can't leave any serious doubt. The answer to each of those questions is yes. If I could just start with Mr. Antoni Pelle's remarks about Massaoui being confused about the conspiracy to which he was pleading guilty. I would draw the court's attention to the letter that he writes to the court saying he wants to plead guilty. And unfortunately, it's under seal because it's an attachment to an under seal motion. But we quote in our brief, page 48 through 49, he clearly understands what he's pleading guilty to. The district court, who was careful and cautious at every turn in this case and bent over literally backwards for Massaoui at every stage, actually holds an ex parte hearing with Massaoui and the one counsel who he would speak to, Alan Yamamoto, with the consent of the government. It's an ex parte hearing. And in that hearing, she wants to satisfy for herself that Massaoui understands what he's doing, that he realizes what he's getting himself into. And during that discussion, it's clear. He engages in a discussion about Blackledge v. Perry, the precise narrow scope of a guilty plea bar. This is exactly, I can't imagine a clear articulation of a defendant who understands that they're waiving their right to challenge all, any constitutional claims that they could have possibly had before pleading guilty. Counsel, may I ask you a hypothetical? Yes, sure. You represent a client who was using drugs and the last thing he remembers is that he was tussling with a young lady, obviously having a romantic interest in her, but he remembers just tussling with her. And he goes to unconsciousness and he wakes up. He's laying next to a woman who has been brutally sexually assaulted and is dead. And he's charged with rape. And he believes that based on what he can recall that he probably did it and they offered him a plea. But the judge said to his counsel, you can't mention anything about the PERC test that was done on the victim. And that forensics came back that the DNA didn't match him at all. There were pubic hairs that didn't match him, gender, I mean, in terms of demographics or anything. And he pleads. Is that a counsel plea? He can't, his counsel can't mention the fact that all that DNA points to exculpatory evidence. But the client believes based on what he last remembers that he probably did because he was in a room, he was tussling, had that interest. You mean to tell me if he pled, that's a counsel plea? It may not be, Your Honor. Why not? Well, because I think whenever you're talking about... Because counsel can't tell him about exculpatory evidence, isn't it? No, what I was going to say, Judge Gregory, is that I think that the question is, whenever you're talking about a restriction on communication between counsel and a defendant, the question is, is that restriction 
is there an in, uh, uh, appropriate interest in the restriction and is it narrowly tailored or appropriately tailored? And, and I think, if I can just back up one minute, Mr. Antoni Pillay has made a, a lot of representations about how counsel couldn't talk about Brady exculpatory information. Uh, and what I'd simply point out is his counsel knew how to lodge an objection with the district court. In 2002, I'm sorry, Judge Williams. What do we do with Judge, Judge Yomamoto's statements during sentencing that life imprisonment was an appropriate sentence for Ms. Alley? I mean, they had a close relationship, didn't they? I, I, Your Honor, I don't know what the relationship was uh, because of the attorney-client privilege, but he's certainly the one attorney uh, out of his appointed counsel that he would speak with, clearly. That wouldn't cure what happened at, at, at the plea, would it? No, and if I could follow up on your question, Judge Gregory, I think that, that what I was going to simply point out is in 2002, before Ms. Sally pleads guilty, and Mr. Antonio Play points this out, his counsel says, wait a minute, Judge, there's this exculpatory information that he doesn't know about. You need to tell him about this, or, or, or he needs to learn about it. Okay, and the plea ends up falling through before they ever get to that question. You fast forward to 2005. You have this court's public opinion that there's exculpatory information out there. You have the 9-11 report. You have limited disclosures that the district court was making to him. He understood that there was stuff out there, and he actually understood the gist of it. I think the record clearly shows that. But you don't hear a peep from counsel saying in 2005, Your Honor, this is the same thing. We have these problems. We can't talk to him about this classified information. He doesn't know. Everyone understands that he, he knows the gist of it and that it's he, his, his choice to pull the plug on the whole process before he gets uh, the information that's supposed on, to be coming to him. He's putting a lot of weight of the constitutional right on, in terms of requirement on the defendant. It is the, the district court who had the outstanding order of the gag. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't the district court know I'm taking a plea from someone and I, evidence under CEPA 4 has been determined to be material. It can't be discussed with him. That's an outstanding, at this point, unmitigated or unameliorated, if you will, order. And you take the plea. How is that the responsibility of the defendant? The court knows that. Your Honor, the district court, the, the, the protective order, if I can just address the protective order, the first part of your question. The district court said several occasions, and we point them out in our brief, that nothing is set in stone. If there's a problem, I'll address it. The protective order itself, paragraphs 3 and 18, allow for modification if there is a, a, a reason that Misawi needs to know something. In 2003, when the issue of the substitutions was coming up before this court, she orders limited disclosure of several classified documents that she says are important, he needs to know about, and he gets them. So, it, again, the district court, every chance that she, in any opportunity that was before her, she made sure that she protected Misawi's rights every step of the way. And the protective order and, and her ordering the limited disclosures is, is – a perfect example of that. Well, was, it, was the process in determining what was going to be disclosed still ongoing when he pled guilty? It was, Your Honor. So no final, final – it had been the Supreme Court. We'd ruled, been the Supreme Court. They ruled or denied, sir. Was the process over then or was it – No, the process, the process was continuing. If you look at the record after he pleads guilty – I mean, literally and, – and this goes to your question, Judge Gregory. Right around the time he pleads guilty, they're working through further Section 4 – designations they're working through further issues if they had seen if, if they had information before them while they're working through this and he's deciding to plead guilty it, it's quite stunning that no one says well wait a minute wait a minute this is so important and the, the fact of the matter is is because he knew uh, essentially what the information was he knew from this court it was exculpatory this court gave him a road map on how to use it and he decides to pull the, pr the plug on the whole process so your position is you think that the defendant can weigh the uh Defendant can waive Brady. Uh, I, I think without uh, knowing what it is. I think if a defendant knows that there is Brady material out there, and he decides that he does not want to see it and he wants to plead guilty, absolutely. And our position in our brief is something very important. You say, sure. And if he decides he doesn't want to see it, tell me in the record where he decided he didn't want to see it. I agree with you. What you just said, I think, is absolutely the case. But do you have it? Tell me where. It's in the record that he decided not to see it, other than the fact that, you, of course, you made the question he pled. 
No, Your Honor, I would point to the plea colloquy and to the ex parte proceeding two days before, where he clearly says, yes, my counsel is telling me not to plead. I understand I'm waiving all my constitutional rights. I don't care. This is a knowing and voluntary choice. Everyone needs to know this. This is what I want to do. And contemporaneous with that, again, he had the limited disclosure originally. He's the one who moved for access to these witnesses. He has the 9-11 report. He knows that it's coming to him. And if you look at his pro se pleadings, he does not want to have anything to do with any of the substitution process. He doesn't want to have anything to do with any of the documentary evidence that's coming to him. He wants to get up and plead guilty because he's guilty. What's the justification for materials having been come to this court through the CEPA 4 process, found to be material? What's the problem? Why would it be precluded from him anyway? What's the justification? I don't think it necessarily would have been precluded, Your Honor. It would have been. Why does he have to go down the line? Now is the time. Justice delayed is justice denied. What do you wait a year from now? You're saying that, well, if you wait long enough, you would have gotten this. But time is of the essence, isn't it, when you're in a situation, particularly in the fast forward when you have a person who a lot of people suspect might have some mental situation. His counsel is asking for examination, and the court made an extensive inquiry in that regard. He wants to abort that process right now and plead guilty. Isn't now the time to make sure you have opened those gates so at least you know that those orders that may be down that road may have been opened, but now isn't it time to make sure they are open, that it is a knowledgeable plea and voluntary? With respect, Judge Gregory, the fact of the matter is that this was an enormous case, as you know. Sure. Tons of information. Five clear defense counsel, the district court, the prosecutors working diligently to try and resolve classification issues. And so with respect, I think the result of the implication of your question is that the defendant would be able to basically hijack the proceedings and say, I want to plead guilty, and no one would be able to let him plead guilty, which is his right, because he would say, we've got to work out the SEPA process first so we can get this material to you, which is what happened at the penalty phase. He gets virtually everything that's material and relevant. But it's not for the penalty. I was on the panel. You came to us interlocutory, and we worked through these things and gave an opinion. Wasn't it time just to get that resolved? Why do you have to wait until sometime? It had been determined to be material, and there were appropriate substitutes. Why wasn't it given? They were, Your Honor. If you look at the timing, the Supreme Court denies cert, and then he pleads guilty, like literally a couple weeks later. So, I mean, essentially what would have had to have happened is the district court would have had to have said, you cannot plead guilty, because the Fourth Circuit has said this is exculpatory and material. What's wrong with that, listening to what we say? No, Your Honor. Something wrong with that? No, not at all, Your Honor. But Massawi certainly understood that it was material and exculpatory, and it's his, as he states over and over again, it's my constitutional right to plead guilty. I have this constitutional right. And he says this in the context. I don't have the page number, unfortunately, but in the ex parte hearing. They poured on the other legal advice. This is my constitutional right. I want to do it. And so she marches him through, again, carefully, cautiously, makes sure that he understands the charges against him, the ramifications of pleading guilty. And I don't know how to answer your question other than to say that a defendant who knows that the material is coming to them, I don't see how they can plead guilty and then claim on appeal, I didn't get the information. And how do you tell me this? I won't belabor it. I'm going to finish. But how in this record can you say he knows it's coming to him? I think this court's opinion is crystal clear that he's going to be entitled to use that information, that it's exculpatory, that it could provide him with evidence to contest guilt based on a theory of multiple conspiracies. How long did he sit in prison after we ruled before he pled? Your Honor, I believe that your opinion came out in December of 2004, and he pleads guilty in March, April of 2005. Now, if we were to find that some of Massaoi's constitutional claims have merit, does that permit us to set aside the plea? Well, I don't think so, Your Honor. I think most of the claims that he raises 
now on appeal, he never raised below. And in addition to that, we don't think any of them have merit, quite frankly. So are we just waiting for another 2255? I don't know, Your Honor. I don't know the answer to that question. Can you tell me what requirements were placed on any lawyer that he might retain or attempt to retain with regard to required security clearances? Yes, Your Honor. I heard Ms. Trantoni-Pillay say that she ruled that she being Judge Rankin of the district court ruled that any attorney who represented him would have to be national security clear. And with respect, we just disagree. The protective order specifically says in paragraph 11 that the security clearance is contingent on access to information. It doesn't say that any attorney who represents him has to be security clear. In April 2002, he has already said at the beginning of the hearing, I want to waive my right to counsel. I want to go pro se, and I want to hire a standby lawyer. It's in that context where she reminds him of his right to choose his counsel. And she makes a comment, and this is in the government's brief at page, in the joint appendix at 246, saying that he had a right to hire an attorney at his own expense, but that the protective order would sort of narrow that in the sense that your attorneys would have to be cleared. And I think the import of that is that that naturally narrows the scope of the universe of attorneys if you want your attorney to see everything. But even if you take that as some sort of comment and that she was wrong about that, subsequent to that, in the Feretta hearing, and any time they talk about standby counsel and later on, she's unequivocal. She never says anything about national security clearance. She's trying, again, the district court is bending over backwards to try and find attorneys for him, anyone that will talk to him. She's relaxing the SAMs constantly. And so there's no indication anywhere that there was a national security requirement for any attorney who was going to represent him. What does the record reflect was the reason Brother Freeman did not represent him? Your Honor, I don't know because I can't sort of speculate as to what Brother Freeman was thinking. I don't know that it's indicated in the record other than mental health evidence, which I won't cite or state, but it's in our brief. Mr. Freeman does make a remark with respect to that question. But Brother Freeman, again, is in the context of Massawi having already waived his right to counsel. And even then, she's relaxing the SAMs for Brother Freeman. She's trying to get anybody, again, who Massawi will communicate with. Well, that history goes back further than that. I remember when Brother Freeman early on wanted to represent him way before the waiving counsel, and he was not allowed to. Correct? Couldn't have contact with him. Your Honor. Was he the Texas counsel? That's correct. I didn't want to go through the – Go through what? What he had to do to qualify. Judge Gregory, with respect, and Chief Judge Williams, if I can – I think I have the answer. I don't recall anywhere in the record before he waives his right to counsel him mentioning Brother Freeman. I don't recall that. There is a mention – I recall having motions up here and some question about whether or not he would be allowed to have counsel of his choice. And this counsel from Texas stepped up and wanted to represent him. I believe that is in the summer of 2002 when Massawi is already pro se. And I don't think that there's any indication at all that Judge Brinkema – For a long time he was held. No one could talk to him. Am I wrong about that? With respect, I'm not sure that that's true, Your Honor. I think that what we cite in our brief are a number of occasions where Judge Brinkema is trying to get Massawi legal advice and with people he would trust, and he's constantly rejecting them. And Brother Freeman, again, once he starts filing pleadings and Massawi starts demanding that he's at counsel table, the district court, who, again, was patient at almost every turn, finally cuts him off and says, you can't be filing ghost pleadings – or ghost writing pleadings, excuse me, and not filing a notice of appearance. And Judge Brinkema saw him, what, about for three years straight? Mr. Massawi? Yeah. Absolutely, Your Honor. I think the district court was very familiar with Mr. Massawi and his thought process. Well, did Massawi's inability to participate in SEPA hearings and review and 
the review of the classified material infringe upon his Fifth Amendment right to self-representation? Uh, no, I, I, with respect, Your Honor, I don't think it, it did. Uh, the, the right to self-representation, of course, is, is, is not absolute and is subject to uh, balancing. This court has said in the Bush uh, opinion, for example, that the government's interest in ensuring the integrity and efficiency of a trial uh, at, at times outweighs the defendant's interest in acting as his own attorney. And so the district court usually has broad discretion with a pro se defendant to impose reasonable restrictions. And so with, res uh, with respect to the SEPA process, the district court understood that it needed to move forward, and so she appointed standby counsel, which she had broad discretion to do. And in fact, at the, in the beginning, she's trying to find different standby counsel. This wasn't just her foisting the appointed counsel on him. She, he waives his right to go pro se and, or excuse me, he waives his right to counsel and goes pro se and says, I don't want these attorneys. And she searches to try and find other attorneys and she can't find a, a medium or a large size law firm to step up and take over uh, for the public defenders. She can't, he's rejecting the other attorneys she's presenting. And so because she wanted, she needed to ensure that he would have a fair trial and there's this massive amount of discovery she reappoints uh, the, or she retains the, the standby counsel, Mr. McMahon, Mr. Zirkin, uh, Mr. Dunham. Let me ask you a question with regard to death eligibility. They ch challenge that, and their argument is that he should never have been, uh, jury should never have been allowed to consider whether or not he was death eligible. Um, my question is, is, deals with the issue of whether or not the statute and the, its application in this case sufficiently narrows the class of people eligible for the death penalty to, so as to be within constitutional limits. The argument could be made that this Mr. Musawi lied to the police like happens every day in every police department in the United States and that as a result of his disavowing any knowledge of co-conspirators that the rule that will come from this case is anybody who does that, anybody who denies falsely involvement with other people in criminal activity will be eligible for the death penalty if those conspirators later commit a murder that you frankly were unaware of the details of. And so my, that, that's a right broad ruling if that is in fact the uh, principle that you. I, I, don't, I don't think, Your Honor, that you would, this court would have to, would have to rule on anything. The, 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 the claim, as far as we can tell, is waived three or four times over. Uh, first of all, as we point out in the briefs, uh, there's nothing in the Federal Death Penalty Act that requires that if a jury finds a defendant death eligible uh, because the government proved a uh, statutory threshold factor, that a term of life is taken off the table. There's nothing in the statute that says that. In reality, defense counsel had taken uh, a term of years off the table. Um, and Mr. Antoni Pillai and I simply disagree on this point. Ms. Howie had some of the most experienced capital counsel in the country working for him. So uh, it's, uh, I think it's somewhat incredible to say that because Judge Brinkema said in 2002 that there were only two choices, that they had somehow got duped into thinking that a term of years was never available. In fact, she doesn't, in, in, the, in the plea, the aborted plea in 2002, in the actual plea hearing in 2005, she's talking about maximums. If death results, then these are the two options. But in uh, 2002, he just aborted his guilty plea, didn't he? He did, Your Honor. I simply yeah. point to that. I simply point to that hearing as an, an example of the district court mentioning that that it's death, life, or a term of years. But as I understand uh, Judge Trax's question, that, that doesn't answer the question in terms of sufficiency. What evidence is sufficient? to make someone death eligible. And that's the question of, in terms of it's a approximate cause type issue. You lied to them, you didn't tell them everything, but you didn't have a, a constant, I mean, you didn't have to say anything, but obviously lying is not protected under the Fifth Amendment, so we know that. So, so he didn't come forth, that's enough to say that that's a direct cause of someone else well, dying if someone else, another conspirator would act. That's the question. I, I, I think to, answer, to answer your question, Judge Gregory, I have two points. One is the, the, the lie is an act of concealment, which has sort of two components, and that is the sort of affirmative lie and the withholding of the truth. That may be a sort of, you know, 
That may have been an interesting question on appeal if he had actually gotten a death penalty. But the fact of the matter is, as we pointed out in our brief, the whole sufficiency question is totally irrelevant because not only does the statute render that the threshold finding, nothing about the threshold finding takes a term of years off the table, but the counsel specifically took a term of years off the table to try and present this binary choice to the defendant. So nothing about the eligibility phase has anything to do with the sentence he receives at the end of the day. So what I was trying to answer Judge Traxler's question is simply you don't have to hold anything about conspiracy liability under the Federal Death Penalty Act in this case because, again, there's no error, first of all, and if there were any error, it's invited. And even under a plain error standard, the district court at sentencing says nothing about being bound. She talks about he's not eligible for a departure or a variance. Why would she say that if she thought she was bound by something? And why would she sentence him on the non-capital counts to life? I still don't understand Mr. Antoni Pillai's connection that she felt bound, automatically bound, to sentence him to life term on the non-capital counts. Well, his argument in that regard is that if you've got a judge who knows this person is going to get life on some counts no matter what, that that influences your decision as to where to go. I just don't think there's any record support for that, Your Honor, in this case because, again, she talks about departures and variance. He's been asking for a life sentence. He wants to present this binary choice to the jury as early as the jury questionnaire. I mean, they're trying to say to even potential jurors, you don't have to impose the death penalty because he's going to spend the rest of his life in jail. And plenty of capital defense counsel choose this strategy. And in this case, given his many chilling admissions throughout the case and his repeated prayers for the death and destruction of Americans, it seems to me at this point to be a wise choice and that perhaps it worked. But, again, at the actual sentencing, his counsel gets up and says that the sentence is proper. And as we point out in the brief, that waives any challenge to a sentence by agreeing that the sentence of life was a proper sentence. And even Judge Brinkema gets up and says, or excuse me, says that it's an appropriate and fair sentence. And so it should be an appropriate, fair, and final sentence because, as I don't mean to repeat myself, Judge Traxler, but you don't have to hold anything about the sufficiency of the evidence in this case. But wasn't it the determination that it was sufficient that left it to life without parole or death? And without that, it would have been life and term of years? No, with respect, Your Honor, there's nothing in the Federal Death Penalty Act that says that if a jury finds a defendant is death eligible, which was what the question in this first phase, that a term of years is taken off the table. There's nothing in the act that says that. The defense counsel had already taken that option off. Again, as early as the jury questionnaire. They wanted to be able to say to the jury, you don't have to impose the death penalty. So, yes, there's nothing in the statute that took that away. And if there are no further questions, I would like to just make one note, and that is at the sentencing hearing, after the district court told Massawi that he was going to spend the rest of his life in a maximum security prison, he replied with four words that really say all there is to say about this appeal. That was my choice. And so we would respectfully ask this court to affirm that choice, his knowing and voluntary choice to plead guilty. Thank you. Your Honors, I have a couple of points I'd like to make in rebuttal, but obviously I'll take any questions that the panel has. My first point is on the right to choose counsel. In the government's brief at page 118, they specifically note that the district court advised Massawi, among other things, that he had the right to hire an attorney at his own expense, but that the right was limited by the protective order requirement that all counsel receive appropriate security clearances before reviewing classified information. At page 98 
of the joint appendix is the protective order provision that says any defense counsel has to go through a national security clearance. So it's absolutely clear, even from the language. Does it say, does it specify what level of clearance? It says you have to go through the standard Form 86, which is the national security background check, the same one that all of us had to go through to get the top secret clearance. And the judge, what the judge actually said at the April 22nd hearing, I'm sorry, it may not be April 22nd, but the April 2005 hearing, Judge Traxler was, when Massawi said, I want to hire my own lawyer, the judge said, you don't have totally unrestricted choice, even if you have the money available to hire an attorney, because the attorneys, as you know, have to be cleared to receive some of the information. So that's the restriction on the right to choose counsel. It was absolutely clear. He objected to it at least 50 times on the record immediately after that requirement. The government also made the point that the right to discuss issues with counsel was not properly preserved, and that's not a fair representation of the record. I'll make a couple quick points. First, as I mentioned during the opening portion of the argument, counsel and Massawi objected innumerable times to the fact that Massawi wasn't being put in the same place as he would have been with these particular statements. In the weeks prior to the plea, in the time between the Fourth Circuit's opinion in Massawi 2 and the time of his plea, he must have filed 15 pro se, you know, pro se filings saying, the court says I'm entitled to these substitutions and I'm not getting them. So that was clearly preserved. And 15 days prior to the plea, defense counsel, who were then appointed at that point again, specifically told the court, you have to give Massawi these particular Brady substitutions. That's before the plea. So there's no question this was preserved. But the more important point is, when you're talking about deprivation of the right to counsel, which is what this is, chronic, you don't waive it by silence. That's the point of the cases that are dealing with restrictions on counsel. It has to be knowingly and intelligently waived. And in United States v. Mudd, the D.C. Circuit explained why this is. Because in order for you to be able to make an objection to explain that this is a problem, to explain that the restriction is preventing you from properly counseling your client, you would have to explain the conversations between you and your client, which you're barred from doing under the ethics rules. So United States v. Mudd explains that in this kind of case, where there's a restriction on attorney-client communications, there's no need for an objection. It's preserved. It's a structural error. And you can't require counsel to come in and try and explain this because it impedes their ethics obligations. But as time has gone by, haven't they gotten a lot more information? They got information after the fact, yes, Judge Williams. My point is, at the time of the plea, they had material exculpatory information. Everybody was asking for it to be shared with Massawi. And Massawi was asking for it to be shared with Massawi. And it's a deprivation of the right to counsel. So you don't need to waive it. They, in fact, did preserve this objection. But again, it would be a devastating ruling to say that a defendant, you could call a plea counsel if at the time of the plea, the defense counsel has material exculpatory information that's clearly been held to be both material and exculpatory. And you can't discuss it with the client. That's just not a valid plea. The government also makes the point that somehow the 9-11 report and Massawi 2 gave the defendant the same amount of information. Neither of that is true. Just on the 9-11, first of all, Massawi 2, the court has seen the public version of that opinion. It's incredibly redacted. It says nothing more than that there's exculpatory information. And that can't possibly put the defendant in the same position. The 9-11 report does have more information. But as to KSM, for example, it doesn't include many details. And the 9-11 commission report's conclusion, having read KSM's statements, is that the 9-11 commission still believed Massawi was part of the 9-11 conspiracy. That's what it says. So reading the 9-11 report is not going to put Massawi in the same place as the statements by KSM that came in a trial that say repeatedly he had nothing to do with 9-11 and that everything the government is pointing to, including the flight training, getting a GPS, getting the knives, that was all for a separate operation that had nothing to do with 9-11. And in fact, let me tell you, KSM through substitution says, here are the other people who were intended for 9-11, including Al-Qahtani. That's not the same thing. 9-11 doesn't put him in the same place. And let me make one point about the issue with classified information when there's public information out there. It can really not be overstated how difficult a situation is 
that you put counsel in where there's public information out there and you have the same information, but it's classified. Because you basically have almost put the counsel in a conflicted situation. Because you cannot discuss the classified information with your client just because it's in the paper. In fact, if that information is in the paper and you accidentally discuss it with them, you may have inadvertently confirmed or denied classified information. It is an extraordinarily difficult thing. So your client comes to you, and the district court knew this. This was discussed on the record many times. So hypothetically, there's an article in the paper or it's in the 9-11 report, and it says, uh, Bob says that Joe was innocent. <clears throat> the client gets Bob says Joe was innocent. And he says, did Bob say that I was innocent? And you can't answer. You cannot answer that question. Because by answering the question, you may inadvertently expose information that the United States has entrusted you with. That is an incredibly difficult position that you've put counsel in. And so it, 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 the notion that getting some public information puts the defense in a better position is not accurate. The right answer is to just follow SEPA. The right information gets to the defense in a manner that it can be used with counsel. Every single issue we have identified in the brief but could have been your, cured by SEPA. Your position is the SEPA process was over when he pled? The SEPA process was not over for all evidence, Judge Traxler, but it was for this evidence. In other words, and the SEPA process is rolling, but for this evidence, the judge had made the finding. There's orders in the record in which he says, this is material exculpatory evidence. The problem is the court thought that it was finished by producing substitutes that were still classified. That's not what SEPA provides. SEPA says that when you go through this process and you've gone through the ex parte process, the product out of that, especially once you found the information to be material, it's not even material and exculpatory, but material, that information has to go to the defendant. That's the explicit language of SEPA. And the, the district court just did not follow SEPA. Again, there was a lot going on. I don't mean to point fingers. It was a very difficult case. But the result of not producing the information in the fashion that could be used by the defendant created a whole host of constitutional errors. They, they, the counsel couldn't talk to their clients about material information. Massawi then had to be excluded from hearings talking about witnesses to whom he had specifically requested access. So he would file a request saying, I want access to so-and-so. But because the declassified or substitutes had not been produced, he couldn't go to those hearings. So you're talking about factual issues. It sounds to me like you're saying the Section 4 process was through, but my question is how about 5 and 6? Is it your position Section 5 and 6 process was completed? 5 and 6 was not complete, Judge Traxler, but 5 and 6 is not meant to get information to the defendant. The whole point of 5 and 6 is you're then talking about information to be used at trial, but it assumes that both the defense and the government have the same information. 5 was really meant for the situation of the Oliver North situation. So before the case starts, the defendant gets some classified information. And so in that position, the defendant and the counsel can talk about it, and everybody has the, the information, right? So in, the, in that circumstance, when you go to do a Section 5 designation that you're going to try and use at a trial, every party has the same information. Section 5 is not to be a, supposed to be a substitute for Section 4. And Section 4 basically requires that when the information goes to the defense, it must be go to the go to put the defendant in the same place he would have been had he gotten the classified information. This did not do that. He was, he was uh, restricted at the time. Um, the death eligibility point, I'm happy to address the issues on this. The, the actual theory of death eligibility is a very scary proposition because it mere, the death eligibility theory was by Massawi telling a lie, if Massawi had told the truth at the time uh, he was arrested, he would have told the government everything that came out in the statement of facts. Not that he would have asserted his Fifth Amendment rights. He would have just said exactly what was in the statement of facts. The government then would have done exactly the same investigation that they did after 9-11 and discovered a number of the hijackers. The FBI would have discovered a number of the hijackers. The FBI would have then passed that information along to the FAA, who would have then prevented each of the planes from being hijacked with the result that none of the people on 9-11 would have died. That theory of death eligibility is just not consistent with the Federal Death Penalty Act, which says you have to prove that the act directly resulted in a death. This reads the word direct out of the statute. So it's clearly not consistent with the Federal Death Penalty Act, but it's also not constitutional. The whole point about the cases on uh, personal responsibility leading to death is that you're looking at the actions of the defendant. And this particular theory would permit any member of any gang 
to be responsible for any act of the gang or any death just merely by not admitting that I'm a member of the gang. Because, of course, after the fact, the police could always come in and say, if I had known that person was a member of the gang, I would have followed that person and I would have figured out everybody in the gang, and then I would have used that information to track down what had happened and I would have prevented the death. So you would essentially read out the personal responsibility out of the Constitution. That's not a proper theory. And as we've made clear, the defense counsel did not make a strategic choice here. So when you have defense counsel coming in at the sentencing and saying this is the appropriate sentence, that's only because they thought the only two sentences were life or death. That's not a strategic choice. So when you're conceding that this is the appropriate sentence, you're saying he got the lower of the two available sentences. The problem is that was wrong. Mr. Masali, saying that he was there to, let me get the right thing. He said what was generally going during that time period was you were in a rush to get through with your jet simulator training so we'd be ready as a pilot to fly the fifth plane into the White House, correct? And he said, correct. And the reason that you wanted to fly the plane into the White House is to kill Americans? Is that fair to say? That's correct. And you've made no secret that since. Well, you knew by the summer of 2001 that there would be multiple strikes. So, Judge Williams, first, let me address separately, very briefly, why his testimony in Phase 1 and Phase 2 does not affect our arguments. For purposes of a counsel plea, you do not show prejudice. That's Getters and Perry. It's a structural error. You don't show prejudice. So it doesn't matter what happened after that. The plea is just invalid. For purposes of the Brady violation, the courts that have been examining a Brady violation to determine whether or not it would have caused the defendant to change their mind if they had had that information, the bottom line is first they apply an objective test. It's not a subjective test. It's an objective test. Would a reasonable person have changed their mind? And second, every single one of those cases basically is trying to figure out whether the evidence at issue was material. Whenever there's a determination that the evidence was material, they conclude in every case that that would have resulted in a change of the defendant's mind. Here, this evidence had been determined to be material, so his testimony later on makes no difference. The final thing about Ms. Alley's testimony that has to be recognized is the man was clearly operating under some mental defect at the time. We've made the record on this point. He had delusions of grandeur. And at the time he was testifying, he was facing either life in prison without parole or the death penalty. Those were the only two options he'd been told. So he did what a lot of defendants, believe it or not, in these kinds of cases, he took responsibility for something he didn't do. He wanted to appear to be a big person. And we looked this up. There's a University of Utah Law Review article that tracks false confessions. And it turns out the more heinous the act, the more people there are that confess to the crime. There were over 500 people, for example, that falsely confessed to kidnapping the Lindbergh baby. And over 250 people that falsely confessed to being the Black Dahlia. Over a dozen people confessed to the crimes for which O.J. Simpson was accused. This man took the stand and he admitted something to which he was not involved and nobody believed it when he took the stand. It just, as a legal matter, it's irrelevant to the Fifth Amendment claim, it's irrelevant to the Sixth Amendment claim, and it does not affect the sentence one bit because the theory on which the government proceeded cannot possibly satisfy either the Federal Death Penalty Act or the constitutional standard, and it's not moot. Because without this, Massawi would have been entitled to a judge sentencing in which the judge had the discretion to enter a sentence of any term of years up to life, but not death. So if Massawi told investigators that I'm a terrorist and I'm attacking Los Angeles tomorrow and the FBI sent all of its agents there, that would not be sufficient under the Federal Death Penalty Act? Well, again, Your Honor, I think in that scenario, if he did nothing more than what you're saying, it would be, I'm not entirely sure. If somebody died as a result of a direct, of an act that he did, then I think he would be liable. But just merely saying I'm a terrorist, if nothing else occurs, I'm not sure he would be liable under the Federal Death Penalty Act. Well, I was assuming that somebody died. So the scenario is somebody, he says I'm a terrorist, he sends some people out, 
there and then somebody dies as a result of his lying. Mm-hmm. Um, I, again, it depends. I mean, the scenario that I've always thought of is if, you, if, you, if you're a soldier or something, you tell somebody to shoot somebody else, but you know that they're perhaps, um, you know, they, they're shooting the wrong person. That's, that's a statement that could result, a lie that could result in a death directly. I don't, I, on that scenario, I don't believe that would satisfy the Federal Death Penalty Act, but it's a closer question. Thank you. Um, if the court would permit me to briefly conclude. I know I'm over my time. You may have another question. Uh, no, I was just going to briefly conclude on, unless okay. the court permitted me. <clears throat> As I've noted, this was a very difficult case for all of the parties involved, not only because Massawi was charged with participating in the 9-11 conspiracies, which is one of the most heinous acts in our nation's history, but because he said terrible things below. And these are the kinds of cases that test our judicial system. Um, it would be a terrible irony if a case against an admitted member of al-Qaeda, an organization that's dedicated to restricting personal freedoms, somehow resulted in weakening the Fifth Amendment right to due process and the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. It's absolutely clear that his, this plea was not counseled and that he did not have Brady at the time of his plea. That plea has to be unwound under the circumstances, and we respectfully request that the court vacate the plea and, in the alternative, vacate the sentence and remand for a sentencing with only a uh, term of years up to life on the table. Thank you. Thank you. We will come down and speak to counsel, and then we will vacate this courtroom. This honorable court will take a brief recess. The Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals heard this case in Richmond, Virginia on January 26th. The court has not issued a ruling yet. You can listen to this program again or read more about the case at www.cspan.org. Just click on America and the Courts under the C-SPAN series link. And join us next week for America and the Courts, Saturday evenings at 7 Eastern on C-SPAN. Thank you.